Um, the geodynamics three. So we're going to continue our discussions. We're now kind of moving into the um, domain of sort of the, the current state. We've talked a little bit about sort of the impact processes and early formation of, of planetary bodies in the, in the disk. We've talked a little bit about giant impacts and some of the events that take place uh, during that interval of time. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the processes that we think are relevant for uh, today. And you know, one of the sort of surprising, maybe odd things, I guess, that I was thinking about when I was sort of putting the material uh, together for this talk was that it reminded me a little bit of a, a course that I took when I was a junior in college. I remember the instructor of the course made some comment very on in the course, something to the effect of, after all, life is all about solving partial differential equations. So the students kind of look at each other, right, and think, hmm, is this guy for real or not for real? I think probably it's even likely that some people check their uh, course schedule to see if maybe this course was offered in the spring term instead of uh, taking it when they were. Uh, I guess the reason I mention this is that I'm going to try to avoid at all possible costs to suggest that mantle convection is the most important thing in your life. Um, but on the other hand, it is certainly something that plays a really central role in our understanding of the way we think the Earth works. And also, I think we need to understand it well enough to be able to imagine how this system works as we go back in time, to try to imagine how it is that the system that we see today could have evolved from these earlier states. And so that's somewhat the goal. This picture right here is an image of a, a temperature field for a, a thermal convection calculation. It's a very simple one. It's a Cartesian 2D box. It's got constant viscosity. And so it's not very Earth-like in many respects. But on the other hand, it does capture a lot of the features and um, processes that are inherent in mantle convection. And a lot of our intuitions and in thinking about this system really can be built up with very simple models like this. And in fact, in the tutorial this afternoon, you guys are actually going to be running 2D models very much in this, in this style. If you look at this plot, what you'll notice is that it's being heated from below, it's being cooled from the top. And if you sort of get a sense of the temperature distribution through this layer, you'll see that it's quite red at the bottom. And you see a fairly rapid variation in temperatures going from red to blue across a very thin layer. Then you see things like thermal plumes, perhaps, something like thermal plumes, hot things rising up, cold things sinking down, possibly nominally like uh, subducted slabs. But the point is that if you were to average the temperature across these layers, picking up some high regions, picking up some low regions, you'd find that the temperature in here would be more or less nominally uniform, it would be fairly similar. And so if you were to characterize the average temperature variations through this layer, you'd see a very rapid adjustment, high temperatures going into sort of intermediate temperatures, and then going from intermediate temperatures down to the low temperatures. And this sort of structure is going to motivate the way that we think and sort of characterize the dynamics of the system. OK. The other point, I guess, is that convection is pretty ubiquitous. We see it everywhere. And so here's an example in the atmosphere, uh, maybe a slightly less photogenic pictures of convection that takes place in the ocean. Here, uh, the case of a cold downwelling just on the edge of the ice shelf of the Weddell Sea. You can sort of track this with temperature anomalies as it goes down and sinks and, and mixes into the interior. All of the atmospheric flows and all of the circulation in the ocean ultimately is being powered by convection. So again, it's a very ubiquitous process. It's really what makes the planet dynamic. And then finally, we get things like this, the convection that takes place in, inside the star. This is sort of a, a blow up of sort of the small scale structure that you can see on the surface of the sun. These hot regions are the bright regions are where the material's rising up. The slightly darker regions are where it's a little bit colder. And in fact, there's a great picture of sunspots just in the uh, stairwell going upstairs just opposite the office that shows a sunspot and sort of this pattern of, of convection. Again, very turbulent convection. Um, this is actually a simulation of that. And it's kind of interesting how the computational and observational communities, they tend to sort of try to match color schemes, right? So this is not red and blue. This is sort of uh, orange and, and slightly black, I guess, to sort of look as much as possible. And it's clear we do this in geodynamics too, right? The tomography models are blue and red, and the seismic models are blue and red. And so I imagine that this is, this is temperature almost certainly, right? It's sort of... Oh, gosh, I have no idea. 
It's very small scale. I mean, this is very, very turbulent, very turbulent convection. And part of the reason I guess I showed this image was simply because the models that the astronomers typically use to characterize the convection in these systems, the so-called mixing length arguments, are often the models that get used to sort of characterize the convection in the magma ocean. And so as we sort of go forward, I wanted to try to have a fairly broad view of convection that would allow us to sort of consider both the sort of standard mantle convection in the in the conventional sense, the current day sense, but also to have some insights in some of the processes and parameterizations of sort of this mixing length where you're sort of very, very turbulent convection. Um, right, okay. So the game plan here, what we're going to try to cover, is I'm going to give you a brief overview to the governing equations. Um, I'm not going to derive these equations, but I'm going to try to give you at least a sense of where they come from so that you'll be able to look at them and get a physical sense of what these things actually mean. In some sense, this is really nothing more than scientific bookkeeping. It's sort of fairly straightforward and fairly mundane. I'm going to introduce you guys to the idea of the Rayleigh number, what that means. Uh, in terms of sort of a comparison of time scales to sort of get the game rolling, and then talk a little bit about the onset of convection because it will play, that process will play an important role in developing the model that most people use to sort of think about the way convection works, and that is the so-called boundary layer model. And then once we have that in place, we'll start thinking about how we scale these results. How do we take estimates of convection today and try to go backwards in time? Because this is really what we want to do if we want to think about thermal histories. How did we get to the present day? We have to know how convection changes, the vigor of convection, the heat flow, the velocities, all that sort of thing changes as we go back in time and, and the planet was hotter. So that's the plan. That's the goal. Okay, so let's start with the governing equations. There's a variety of ways that you can do this. Um, I think probably the most intuitive way or the sort of most physically uh, uh, sensible way to do this is to think about it from the point of view of the fluid parcels. Okay, traveling through the, the fluid, either some mass or the volume associated with this guy. And so you just sort of imagine putting dye on a particular uh, part of the fluid and you just simply track that parcel as it moves through the fluid. You know, it, its position changes with time, perhaps its shape can change with time, but it's sort of a collection of particles that we've identified. And the way that we're going to keep track or sort of do the bookkeeping or do the accounting is with something that we'll call a Reynolds transport theorem. It's, it's, it's actually relatively easy to derive, and if you guys were really insistent, we could probably do this on the blackboard in about two or three minutes. But if you'll accept the result, we'll just simply take this result and apply it over and over again to do all these conservation equations. So the idea here is that we've got some quantity. It could be density, it could be temperature, anything you want. F could be anything. And you're going to integrate that over your parcel. And Typically what you want with the governing equations is you want to know how that quantity integrated over that parcel changes as a function of time. And the Reynolds transport theorem tells us that basically that change of that integral with time following this fluid parcel is expressed in this way. It has two parts. It has one part because F can be changing as a function of time. You know, as this parcel moves along, the value of density or temperature or something may change, and so that will make the integral different. But it has this extra piece, and this extra piece simply arises from the fact that both F and also the volume that actually describes that parcel can both be changing with time. And so it's essentially the change of this volume with time which is, gives rise to this additional piece. And so if you'll permit me to just simply say we can show that this is true, or it may be shown, you know, that you often see in papers, um, we'll just simply apply this and sort of see how the governing equations emerge. Okay, so as an example, the mass of the parcel is just simply the volume integral of the density, okay? And so if we want to know what conservation of mass is, we say, how does the mass of that parcel change? Well, if the mass of the parcel doesn't change, then it should be zero. We apply the Reynolds transport theorem, and so this is an exp expression of conservation of mass. And the point is that the conservation of mass is true whether or not I take this entire volume, whether I take half of the volume, a third of the volume, any sort of subset or collection of volumes, this has to be true. And so the only way that's going to be true for any arbitrary volume is if this integrand in the center here is actually equal to zero. So that was as easy as it is, and so that gives you conservation of mass. And there's a variety of ways that you can write this equation, and there's a variety of approximations that mantle convection solutions make uh, in terms of trying to implement this, which are probably worth pointing out. I can take this expression and I can expand it. I can just take this derivative and, and apply it to the velocity first, 
and then apply it to the density, and I get these two terms that emerge. Uh, and then the other thing I can point out to you is that these two pieces are actually kind of special. Um, this combination of, of terms is often combined together into this, which is described as the material derivative. So it just simply describes the way in which the density of a fluid parcel changes as you, as you follow it through the fluid. Okay? And it's actually not, again, it's, this is not very complicated. For these people on this side, I guess, if you're thinking about density as a function of position and time, the idea here is that both the position both the position and the time are changing, right? Because we're tracking this through the parcel. So you could imagine this being the partial of the density with respect to x times dx dt. That was the symbol formerly known as, as rho. And there could also be the fact that the density itself is changing, right? So you've got two pieces. This piece looks a little bit like the gradient of the density times the velocity. This piece just looks like the derivative. And essentially, that's what we've got right here. We've got these two pieces. It's just the density following the parcel. And it's a very natural way to think about representing these systems. OK. So in most mantle convection calculations, we make the assumption that the fluid is incompressible. And what that means is that the density following the fluid parcel does not change. And so if the density of the fluid parcel uh, does not change, this derivative vanishes, and we require then that the divergence of the velocity basically be zero. And that's the assumption that will be made in the uh, exercise that you guys do this afternoon. But there are other approximations that you could make. So for example, we know that a fluid that has large variations in pressure, like the core, that if you were to move a piece of fluid up and down through the pressure gradient, that it's going to expand or it's going to contract as it moves up and down through pressure. And in fact, if you imagine that that fluid was well mixed, so that as you move the fluid up or you move the fluid down, its density changed in such a way that it was exactly the same as its neighbors, if we come back to this original expression here, then in that context, this time derivative would completely vanish. And the description of conservation of mass would be given by the divergence of the velocity times the density equaling 0. And that's another approximation. It's a slightly better approximation for the mantle. And it's called the analastic approximation. And again, you'll often see that. I don't think, CG, we're probably planning on talking about that this afternoon, right? Anyways, OK. What's this? We'll do this later, perhaps. OK. So conservation of momentum. Again, it's exactly the same procedure. We define the momentum. It's just simply the velocity times the density integrated over the parcel. And Newton's first law, I don't know if whether you remember all of these, but Newton's first law says that the momentum is actually conserved if there's no forces acting on it. So this will be conserved in the absence of forces. Of course, if there are forces, then what we're really talking about is at Newton's second law. So in other words, the rate of change of momentum, the acceleration of the parcel, is just equal to the force. And this can include a bunch of different things. This can include gravity. It can include pressure, drag forces, et cetera. We just add all these various forces up. We add it to this side. We do our magic with the Reynolds transport theorem, and essentially out pops conservation of angular momentum. And so again, it's fairly straightforward. And then finally, for the conservation of mass, uh, we could define heat in this way, but you'll notice that there's an asterisk here, and often I'll have these asterisks, and there's usually fine print that needs to be read somewhere uh, connected with this. This is for, it's more simple to derive this uh, in the context of constant density in CP, but it's not required. But just for illustrative purposes, if we define the heat this way, uh, making these assumptions, then we can carry through exactly the way that we've just described. We described the heat content is right here. We want to know how the heat content of that parcel changes as a function of time. There are two ways that we can do this. We can either have heat being conducted in or out of the parcel over the boundary which is this. And we imagine that heat flux being as a result of conduction of heat into or out of that parcel. Or we could have uh, radiogenic heat sources inside the parcel, which are heating it up as a function of time. And again, it's exactly the same thing. We would use the divergence theorem to convert this surface integral into a volume integral. They're all volume integrals. We would use Reynolds transport theorem to expand that out and out pops conservation of energy. And so the equations for an incompressible fluid are sort of summarized here. We have conservation of mass, which I described as that, which implies no divergence of velocity. 
Okay? Conservation of momentum, again, is just Newton's second law. It's the accelerations right here, the velocity, the change in the velocity following the parcel. So it's the acceleration of individual fluid parcels are equal to the forces that act on them. In this particular example, we're thinking about pressure forces, uh, buoyancy forces, as well as viscous forces. And this term I'm using here is just the viscosity of the fluid, which we've heard about uh, in the last couple of talks. And then finally, conservation of heat, just the change in the heat content of the parcel either occurs by diffusion or it occurs by um, heat processes. And the thing I want to remind you about here is this material derivative uh, does involve the velocities. So again, if we can just maybe pop the lights for just a sec, remember that dt, dt is equal to the partial of t with respect to t plus v dot grad t, right? That's the temperature following the parcel. It's described in this way. And so the point is, if you're thinking about a uh, problem, what's happening? You've got some thermal anomalies, let's say, that give rise to a buoyancy force. That produces fluid flow. The fluid velocity then enters the material derivative, which affects the temperature. That changes the density, which modifies the fluid. And computers love doing this stuff. They just back and forth forever, as long as you tell it to keep going, just iterating between these two equations, time-stepping the velocities and the temperature fields in a way. OK. So let's now turn to a couple of things that you've probably seen before, the notion of a couple, how do you transport heat inside planets, what are the dominant mechanisms, and where do those mechanisms actually take place? And so uh, the conduction process, again, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, the notion that you transport heat from uh, hot to cold by virtue of sort of lattice vibrations or in metals, you can do it by transport of electrons. But the point is that you're just simply transferring heat by vibrations or something like that from one place to another. And you can characterize the time scale for how long it takes to get heat from one place to another, in sort of order of magnitude scaling, in terms of this sort of time scale for conduction. And so if you know the distance that you need to go and you know the thermal diffusivity of that material, which is just the thermal conductivity divided by the density and the, speci and the specific heat, okay, this has units of meters squared per second, that will give you the time it takes to get heat from this side to this side. So, you know, the standard... Uh, it was funny, actually. Michael had a graduate student who, when his, he was giving a thesis uh, defense, he talked about the fact that Canadians, for some reason, when they talk about heat conduction, always introduce turkey analogies, right? And it's true. Um, I don't know why that is, but it is true. And so I, I was, have been, in the last few years, trying to sell a cookbook that's entirely based on this formula, right? And so, okay, well, hear me out. See how this goes. So, you know, the problem with turkeys uh, is that <laughs> you, you, when you cook them, you cook them by mass, right? They say if the turkey is this big, then you have to cook it for this many hours per pound. And then if it's this big, you cook it for a different amount of time. And so it's not a good system. And, and the reason is that they, they sell turkeys by, by weight, right? I think, and, and to use this formula successfully, what they should be doing is selling turkeys by surface area, right? They should say, okay, this turkey has, this spherical turkey has this much surface area, right? And if you want to know what the thermal conductivity of turkey is, uh, it's basically the thermal conductivity of water, okay? And so that tells you essentially how long it's going to take to get heat from the outside of your turkey to the inside of your turkey, okay? Which is great, but there's, there's even a better result that comes out of this that the standard cookbooks don't tell you. You can rearrange this formula for L in terms of these others. So L, if you rearrange, it would say L, the distance, is equal to the square root of the time times kappa. And the reason why that's important is that if you're having people over to your place uh, for a turkey dinner and you forget to put the turkey into the oven until maybe, let's say, an hour before you eat, what the, the conduction distance formula will tell you is how deep you should carve into your turkey to serve, <laughs> right? So I think that this has a lot of, a lot of features. It's still early days getting it, getting it started, but I think it has a lot of promise. Okay, so the advection problem is a lot easier, right? I mean, advection, you're just simply taking the heat. Ed, yes? Yeah. <laughs> Um, generally, when I, generally when I do it, advection doesn't enter into the problem, actually. It's very, very, yeah, that's right. So, but 
the advection is pretty simple, right? I mean, advection just simply means that rather than wait for conduction to carry the heat from here to here, I'm just going to take this hot fluid, I'm going to put it over here. And so how long it takes is really just a function of how far I have to go, right, and how fast I move it there. And so that gives me this additional time scale. And so we, yeah? Shouldn't that mean that you should have the turkey before you cook it? <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good idea. But the problem with that is that that's not what your guests have come to see, right? They want to see the outside thing nicely browned. Anyways, maybe I, we digress a little. The point is that you can sort of think about, well, how important are these two processes in the interior, right? You can sort of take the ratio of these time scales. And so if you do that with these estimates, you get a, a relative importance that depends on the velocity, the size, and the thermal conductivity. And if you put in typical numbers for the Earth's mantle, you get a ratio of about 1,000. So in other words, it takes about 1,000 times long to cool something by conduction as compared with how long it takes to cool by advection. Okay, well that's important. So that means advection absolutely dominates in terms of heat transport in the interior planets of the size of Earth at the very least. Okay, so let's make now a connection to the thermal conduction problem. So we heard Dave Ruby talking about the parcel dropping down, and that was Stokes' law. That's essentially what's expressed here. The velocity of a parcel, if it's buoyant, let's say has some excess or, or density deficit, right, will rise if it's warm, and it will be resisted by a drag force, and the rate at which it rises up will depend on its size, L, it will depend on gravity, and it will depend on the viscosity that it's actually moving through. And so if I make the explicit connection to the temperature fields. So in other words, the reason why this thing is dense or light is because it's, it's, it's cold or, or warm. If I substitute this for the density, then take this estimate of the velocity and put it back into that relative estimate of my time scales, I get this expression coming out. And what this number is, is the Rayleigh number. Okay? And so if, again, if I put in numbers for the typical length scales, the temperature difference across the layer perhaps, uh, I get a number of order of 10 to the 8th. And so you might think, well, there's something a little suspicious here, right? Because this number is 10 to the 8th, and yet I told you on the previous slide uh, that it's about 1,000, right? But the issue here, I suppose, is that I've done something a little unusual. I've kind of said that my parcel has the size of the mantle, and it's rising up through the mantle. That's, that's of course, nonsense. Before I do the problem, I don't know what the length scale is going to be. And so often these problems, if you're going to sort of non-dimensionalize or, or adopt some characteristic length scales, you adopt the things that you know. And so you do know the thickness of the layer. And so that may not be a good representation of the size of this. But it is a length scale that you can define the problem. You get a Rayleigh number, and it tells you something about the vigor of convection. It tells you something about the relative importance of advection versus conduction. Um, and so it's a very, very useful measure for characterizing convection. In fact, in mantle convection, where inertial effects are really, really small, this is the only number that matters. Nothing else matters. And everything collapses into a, a function of just this number. And there's sort of a critical value that's required to get this whole process started. Yes? So, yes, right. So it's funny, you know, in engineering, for example, when people talk about advection, they often use the word convection. And so they're used interchangeably. So when I say advection, so I guess I come from a more geophysical school, advection means physically transporting heat. And because convection is such a, a ubiquitous part of the Earth systems, we tend to reserve the word convection for some buoyancy-driven flows. Right? But it's, if you were to go to an engineering community and talk about convection, they would mean my ad advection. In your uh, presentation, advection and convection, they are complementary to each other. They don't make the same Well, I would say that what makes convection, how's, how's this? I would say what makes convection so efficient at getting heat out of the planet is because of advection. How's that? But I'm going to use the terms interchangeably, I'm afraid, because I took engineering classes, and so I have this cross-wired brain. So convection, advection, it's the fluid motion of heat. And in a planet, in our planet, and the things that we're going to care about, the things that we're going to talk about, those motions are driven by buoyancy. So if you're affecting heat as a hanging wall, normal wall, it doesn't It might not, actually. Yeah. And so you could call that advection, too. But it's still motion. Right? Yeah. Okay.
So, okay, so here's like a thought experiment. We start with a fluid that's, that's cooled from above, it's heated from below, and it develops this conductive temperature profile. And that's a perfectly good solution to the equations of motion. In fact, it's good for any arbitrary delta t. You stick that solution into those equations that I described earlier, and it's a solution. No velocities. Perfect. But you know that as you increase this temperature, at some point, eventually you're going to get instabilities developing and convection will start to begin. And so there will be, must be some delta t that's required that you have to bring this up to that convection will actually start. But you could imagine that it could depend on a variety of different things, right? Like you could imagine that if the fluid was very viscous, very sticky, that you'd need a somewhat larger delta t to overcome that viscous resistance to get the whole thing going. On the other hand, if the thing here had a large thermal expansivity, so in other words, just a very small temperature difference really made a large difference in the, in the density of the material, then maybe a small temperature perturbation would be enough to produce a density perturbation which was large enough to drive flow. And so it turns out, I haven't proved it to you, but it turns out that the only thing that matters in this question is this Rayleigh number. And so if delta t is a certain value, when it goes unstable will depend on all of these other parameters. It will depend on the coefficient of thermal expansion. It will depend on gravity. It will depend on the size of the layer. It will depend on the thermal diffusivity. And what I've done here, which I didn't explain but maybe should, is very often, and in many of the subsequent slides, I'm going to take the viscosity, which is the normal one that people think about in mantle convection in Pascal seconds, and I'm going to divide it by density and get a kinematic, what we call a kinematic viscosity, which has units of meters squared per second, which is easier, at least for me, to think about. And so we're going to use that a lot. And so you're going to see it here, the kinematic viscosity, and the density has disappeared from that particular place right there. Uh, yeah. That's correct, yes. They're the, same, they're the same thing, it's just a different normalization, yes. So one's often called the absolute viscosity, sometimes one's called the kinematic viscosity, but I would say in the geophysical literature, almost uniformly, it's the absolute viscosity that gets reported, right? It's sort of in Pascal seconds, almost always. Does the viscosity Of course it does. Of course it does. Here. Yes, no, that's right. So I'm thinking about a constant viscosity case in this particular instance, but it's absolutely true that the viscosity will change with temperature. That's absolutely right. But if I pick a viscosity in the same spirit that I pick a length scale, then I will get a Rayleigh number. And then I have to be, as long as I'm consistent, it's fine, right? I have to just be careful that I'm consistent. Okay, so we'll go back to our thought experiment. So the point is that it will be some value of these, some value of the Rayleigh number in which this will actually take place. So the way in which this calculation actually gets done um, is to introduce a very small perturbation in this conductive state. And in many ways, this process is very much like the problem that Gabby described on Monday, right? If you have an earthquake and it produces a perturbation, in essence, and you then set a whole bunch of normal modes ringing, it's a complete analog to this particular problem here. We introduce a small temperature perturbation. We then allow for this small temperature perturbation with some specific temperature dependence. And instead of being periodic in time, it's just simply exponential in time. We substitute this into the equations of motions. We find that a whole bunch of different modes get excited. And what we do is instead of calculating the frequency of those normal modes, what we do is we calculate their growth rates. Okay? And if the growth rate sigma is negative, then some of those modes will gradually decay and disappear with time. But if a single mode has a growth rate which is positive, then it will grow and the convection will be unstable. And so all you need is one mode to be unstable and then this system goes, goes unstable. And so what we typically do is, is make small perturbations. We linearize the equations, that is, neglect products of, of these small quantities. It's an eigenvalue problem we solve for the growth rates. And there are books that are devoted to this, you know, uh, entire books that go from one stability problem to the next, more or less applying the same technique over and over and over again for all of these different situations in different uh, physical environments.
Very often, though, what you want uh, is if you can't figure out how to do the stability problem or you want to check that your numerical code is right and you want to check it against some of these things, it's nice to be able to calculate growth rates from your numerical calculations. And that's one of the things, again, that you're going to do in your tutorial this afternoon. And this is just an example of how you might go about doing that. If you were to take the solution, it doesn't matter what part of the solution. It could be the temperature in the middle of, the, of your layer. It could be anything, a velocity someplace, an x velocity, a y velocity, a z velocity, whatever. You take a solution at three different times, and I've assumed here that this is particular temperature. And I, ask, I know that my temperature is going to grow. The solution is going to grow exponentially if it's unstable, or it will decay exponentially if it's, if it's stable. Okay? And so I expect that the rate, the difference between the temperature at point 3 versus the initial point, time 1, divided by some intermediate time, 2 to 1, is related to the exponential by this expression. And so I can rearrange this value for the growth rate. And from a single numerical solution, taking three different points, I could actually estimate for that particular choice of Rayleigh number that I do the calculation at what the growth rate is. Okay? And so I might get a plot like this. So this has a growth rate which is positive, so it's unstable. Maybe I dial down the Rayleigh number a little bit. I redo the calculation. And I get a, a mode down here which is negative then I know that somewhere in between here, and I can probably just linearly interpolate to figure out what the critical value is. Okay? Um, one thing I would comment, sort of just from personal experience, is you have to wait until, remember I said when you introduce this perturbation, you get all these modes, some grow, some decay. The fastest growing one will eventually emerge as the dominant. And you kind of have to give this a little bit of time to get sorted out before you actually start to do this calculation. But it's a really effective way of testing codes. It's also a very effective way of figuring out what the critical Rayleigh number is. Because if you actually come really close to this point, the growth rate's so small that it takes forever to be able to figure out whether it's growing or decaying. So it's kind of, in some ways, a little bit nicer to go further away and then calculate the growth rates and then just interpolate in between. And the crossing then gives you the, the critical value, the value that's required for the onset. So this marginal stability that's neither unstable or stable defines the boundary where instabilities start to occur. OK. So this then sets us up really to think about the boundary layer problem. This is the theory, I guess, that probably most geophysicists have in mind when they think and talk and try to reason about the way in which convection actually works. And so the idea is you start with a fluid which is, has a, a conductive temperature profile, some instabilities develop, the fluid begins to convect, and you end up evolving to a state which has a fairly well-mixed interior where the temperature is fairly constant, and then these very steep temperature gradients uh, near the boundaries. And you can see that in the first image, that uh, simulation that I showed on the very first slide. So the point is that I've already told you that the transport of heat in the interior is mostly advection in, inside a body the size of the Earth. And so, for example, the vertical velocity, the vertical transport of heat, this QZ, depends on the vertical velocity. And I'm, I have told you that this is the dominant mechanism of heat transport in the interior. right? But the point is, as I get close to the boundaries, either here or here, the vertical velocity is going to vanish. And so advection can't be the dominant mode of transport as I get close to the boundaries. I have to have a transition in the style of heat transport that would allow me to get all that convected heat transport out of the fluid. And the way in which the fluid does it is by developing these boundary layers, these sort of transition layers, where you have very, very steep temperature gradients, which can conduct, so the heat's being transported by advection, although this is part of the convective process. Maybe bad choice of words, I guess. But ultimately, this advected heat transport has to be conducted out of the system. And these steep boundary layers develop to be able to do that for you. Yeah. It sure should. And so in some sense, I'm kind of thinking about this as a potential temperature. But you're absolutely right. In the mantle, where the effects of pressure are important, you're absolutely right. This would have an adiabatic part. From the point of view of the dynamics, though, and I think this is probably true, that most dynamics people, you really want to subtract the adiabat out because it has nothing to do with dynamics. So in some sense, the adiabat is the equivalent of an isotherm in a, in a kitchen table experiment. OK. And for this particular problem where it's absolutely symmetric, right? The, this boundary is the same as this boundary. There's nothing to sort of dis differentiate this side from this side. You would expect this temperature in the interior to be roughly halfway between uh, the temperature across the top and bottom. OK. The point here is that if 
understanding the detailed motions of the fluid in the inside and how the fluid motions are carrying heat in the interior is actually pretty complicated. But on the other hand, understanding the boundary layers, which is just purely conduction, is a lot easier. And so the key to really understanding convection, in some ways, is just simply understanding the nature of the boundary layers. OK, so let's see if we can do this. So here's just another picture of that same uh, temperature setup. We've got this sort of well-mixed interior convection. We've got these steep boundary layers. And the whole question of what the heat transport is coming out of the fluid really just boils down to characterizing these boundary regions. If I know that the temperature drop across this layer is roughly delta T by 2, I know the thermal conductivity, I know roughly, if let's say I know by some means the thickness of that boundary layer, this length scale L theta, um, then my conductive, my convected heat flow, okay, the amount of heat that's being carried by the system and expelled through the top is basically given by this formula. Okay? And I don't need to care or know anything about the details of what's going on in here if I can characterize the thickness of that boundary layer. That's the key point. Okay. And often in these problems, you want to sort of characterize, you want to think, well, how efficient is my convective system? How much better is it than just simply letting the heat uh, escape by conduction alone, never having had any convection at all? And so we can define what the conducted heat flow would actually be, uh, which would be this, temperature going from here to delta T, linearly varying across the fluid layer. Then essentially the conducted heat flow in this sort of hypothetical but unstable state would have been this. And then we can take the ratio of these two heat flows. If I substitute these things, it just involves a ratio of these length scales. And that's what we call the Nusselt number. And so it's sort of a non-dimensional measure of just how effective the convective process is. And in some ways, the goal of a lot of the stuff that we're going to subsequently talk about is figuring out ways of predicting what this Nusselt number is. But equivalently, what that's telling us is essentially what the convective heat transport actually is. And again, small, small print implies something that I'm going to come back later. This really represents an average value in some sense. OK? All right. The whole temperature profile is an average. That's in, in this picture, that's right. But we're going to see in just a sec that, in fact, in detail, it probably isn't an average value. But we're going to sort of average it. So let's just imagine how this might work. It's sort of, again, a thought experiment. Um, and we'll actually see how this model completely transfers over to the plate tectonic environment in just a, just a minute. So imagine, OK, we have our cold boundary here where we're maintaining a cold temperature. Okay, this could be the surface. We've got our well-mixed interior, sort of roughly at delta T by 2. And we have some cold region here. And now I'm going to go back to the turkey analogy, right? And thinking, how long does it take for the coldness of this boundary to propagate into the interior? So in some ways, it's the opposite of the turkey problem. I guess it's the turkey cooling problem, if we want to sort of keep the turkey analogy going, OK? So how long does it take for this, the coldness of this boundary to penetrate into this warm fluid? And so we know that on the basis of the conduction formula I, t I told you guys earlier, this was this carving recipe, that this is how far the coldness will penetrate. It depends on the thermal conductivity, and it depends on how long. So you know, again, in, the, in this sort of hypothetical thought experiment, we're starting with hot fluid all the way up to the boundary. We then allow conduction to sort of penetrate into this uh, fluid. The layer thickness grows as the square root of time. And this layer gets thicker and thicker and thicker as time proceeds. So eventually, you could imagine that this layer gets thick enough that this layer in itself becomes unstable. It's almost like thinking about the stability problem in isolation, right? I've got a fluid that's being uh, cooled from above and, and sort of heated from below. I've got some nominally linear temperature variation across it. There must be some value for the thickness of this layer where that'll be enough for this layer to become intrinsically unstable. And so I can define a Rayleigh number, kind of a local Rayleigh number, that depends on the temperature difference across the layer, delta T by 2. It depends on the thickness of the layer, this value right here, alpha, G, thermal diffusivities, all the things that the regular Rayleigh number depended on it. But we're just simply focused in on just the boundary layer part. And we, we expect that when this local Rayleigh number reaches the critical value, which sort of is of order about 1,000, that we might expect that this layer will be unstable. Perhaps the cold fluid that's in that layer will sort of dump into the interior of the fluid, produce a plume, perhaps, or something like that, or a cold downwelling. 
and then we'll sort of recycle this whole process. This hot material will come back to the edge, we'll start building this layer again, it will go unstable, and then it will purge, and we'll do the whole process over and over and over again. Okay? Does this make sense? Yeah? How much more complicated does this get if you start saying, oh, my material is cold enough that it's not a fluid anymore? It's got... A lot, actually. I mean, is there some easy way to do that? Or no, there is not, actually. And we'll come back to that at the end. Because that's one of the examples. So for example, the influence of plates on convection is still a zeroth order question. And in some sense, I would argue that we're still not completely sure we know the sign of the effects. And you'll see that in some of the results that I show later. But let's sort of just build this up and then sort of deal with those complications then subsequently. OK. So here's the problem that I just showed you guys before. Here's the heat flux that's coming out the top. It depends on the temperature difference across the layer. It depends on the thermal conductivity. It depends on this length scale, which is just this guy right here. And again, this is growing with time. And so what I really want to do is I don't really care about the details of over these many cycles. I want to really average this over time and get a sort of an average estimate of how much heat is being transmitted through this layer before it goes unstable and then mixes into the interior. And so I just do the math, right? I just have the local heat flow as a function of time, which is this expression right here. I integrate it over time from beginning to when it goes unstable, and then we start over again. And you do the integral, and you get this expression right here, which again depends on now the total temperature across the layer, which is kind of interesting. And this length scale, this sort of kappa TC, the critical time, is just that original length scale where the fluid goes unstable. So this parameter appears in my local Rayleigh number, and I'm defining this value. That length scale is defined by the condition that the local Rayleigh number, based on that length scale, equals the critical value. So in other words, making this connection between the critical uh, Rayleigh number for instability, connecting it to my local Rayleigh number, and using that to define my length scale essentially tells me what this average heat flow is. So I'm done. I actually now know how to characterize the heat flow, the average heat flow coming out of a convecting system, just by thinking about thermal instabilities at the boundary layer. It's pretty amazing. I haven't worried about anything that's going on in the interior, and yet I'm going to get an estimate of the heat flow coming out of this convecting system. OK. So that's what this Nusselt number, Rayleigh number relationship is again. So here's the average heat flow that I told you about before. Uh, it depends on this sort of length scale where the boundary layer goes unstable. I've defined my local Rayleigh number here, but now I've substituted in the critical value for that, right? So this is the value I think this is going to go unstable when this Rayleigh number equals that critical value, roughly about 1,000, okay? And the other point you'll notice is that this looks a lot like the regular number, maybe except for the, of this pesky factor of 2, and the fact that this is a different length scale than the overall length scale. <coughs> But if I can still write this in terms of the original uh, Rayleigh number and just make those substitutions, right? Like put L cubed here uh, to get that and divide by L cubed to get rid of the L cubed there, have the 2 here for that. The point is that this relates the critical Rayleigh number, this factor of 1,000, my actual Rayleigh number, and then the length scale at which this goes unstable. And so it's just simply a matter of a little bit of rearranging. I get the length scale that goes critical divided by the overall thickness of the fluid as being this function of the Rayleigh number. It depends on the Rayleigh number to the one-third <coughs> inverse. And so my Nusselt number, which you may remember, if I just go back just a couple of slides, was just the ratio of these length scales is essentially my Nusselt number, the small scale on the bottom. And so again, all I do is really just invert this guy to get my Nusselt number. And so this is the parameter that most people find, and it's actually the scaling relationship that you guys are going to get, I hope, out of your numerical simulations this afternoon. It won't be perfect because really this is going to be valid, valid when the Rayleigh number gets quite high. If you were doing these calculations at relatively low Rayleigh numbers, just maybe marginally above the critical value, you'll probably see something different than this. But as the Rayleigh number gets larger, larger and larger and larger, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th, you should tend to asymptotically approach this value. And so one of the exercises this afternoon is to see if you can actually reproduce this result with the numerical calculations. OK. So are there questions about that before I press on? No? Guys are good? OK. So let's just maybe just make a couple of comparisons with the Earth mantle. And it's actually pretty remarkable. Um, you know, in some ways, you're picking parameters to make this stuff work out, I would acknowledge. But it is still pretty amazing that you can pick reasonable numbers and get reasonable results. And 
and we'll come back to this in, in the end to see whether or not this is very sensible or not. But here's the length scale. That's the thickness at which the uh, boundary layer goes unstable. So we could think of that as being like the thickness of the oceanic plate just before it goes unstable and subducts. And so, you know, we use 10 to the 8th for the Rayleigh number. We have a critical value of 1,000. Uh, the thickness of the mantle, about 2,900 kilometers. And you get a thickness of about 80 kilometers. Not bad. You can also get estimates of the velocity fields. Um, and this is a little bit more contrived. We'll see maybe a slightly better way to do this in just a sec. But you could imagine that you're forming a mid-ocean ridge. It's thickening with time as sort of this, the cooling time goes. Eventually, we get to the critical value, OK? the critical thickness where it goes unstable. How long that takes, we can figure out just simply based on the cooling time. If we know that the plate has some typical dimension, let's say the size of the plate is roughly comparable to the thickness of the, of the layer, which is a reasonable first approximation, then you can ask the question, how fast does the plate have to go to get you there in the amount of time that you've got? It gives you an estimate of the velocity. And it turns out that it's Rayleigh number divided by this critical value to the 2 thirds. And so you can put in numbers, see how you do, and you get something on the order of a centimeter and a half per year. Not, not perfect, but actually pretty remarkably good for such a very simple formula that doesn't have any temperature-dependent viscosity, that doesn't have all the complications that the mantle actually has. You're getting numbers in terms of the thickness of the boundary layers, in terms of the velocities, which actually seem pretty, pretty reasonable. Yeah? So if, if um, mantle convection was layered uh, for the upper mantle, you'd, you'd take a value of L Yes, it certainly would. It certainly would. But the other thing that would change, of course, is your Rayleigh number would now be much different than the 10 to the 8th because your layer thickness would be much less, right? Any idea what, uh, what the boundary You know, what I would do probably, to, in honest, is I would choose the parameters here that gave me 80 kilometers, which is a point that we're going to come back to at the end. I'm not sure. I would be, I would be surprised, to be honest, if it was substantially different. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it's length of the two thirds. The temperature will change a little bit, um, but my guess is the answer will be not so different. Actually, I mean it'd be a little different because it, it, intuitively I know that when you have these layered systems and you're going to do parameterized convection, which is where we're going to go next, that generally speaking, layered systems have slightly lower heat flows, right? And so. Oh, yeah. So, well, you can kind of see this here, right? It's, it's just going to, you're going to change it by a factor of 10 to the one, the one third, right? And so you want to make that smaller? Yeah, so it will change by a factor of, of three or something like that, right? Huh. I've, many, at many steps on this process, I've tossed away factors of two. So factors of three are sort of at the margin of significance, I think, actually. But it's a fair point. I guess maybe what we're kind of getting at, and I'm going to actually get to this in the end, maybe this is a fairly compliant system. But nevertheless, it gives you the right order of magnitude. So it's, it's clear that it's not completely wrong, I guess is the point that I'd like to stress. And it's maybe amazing that it's as good as it is, perhaps. OK. I, I'm actually very fussy on using, or really very partial to using the idea of energy arguments for doing things. Uh, for many problems, at least for me, it's a much easier way to think about things than worrying about vectors and forces and that sort of stuff. And so I wanted to digress just for a sec to introduce uh, a couple of uh, ideas based on energy arguments, in part because we can use these same arguments to do the uh, magma ocean convection. It's a lot easier to think about the magma ocean convection from this point of view compared with what we've done so far. And so this is the momentum equation, the conservation of momentum equation that we derive. So here's the material derivative velocity, right, with the sort of the, the two pieces of it uh, following the parcel. And then these are my forces, the pressure force, the buoyancy force, and the viscous force. And to get convert this from a vector equation into an energy equation, the kinetic energy equation, all that I have to do is multiply this equation by the velocity and then integrate over the volume. Okay? And you can kind of see this here, right? V times the partial derivative of V with respect to T is also just the partial derivative of 1 half V squared, effectively the kinetic energy. We don't worry about densities. Okay? And I, I'm going to assert, and again, this is slightly more math 
but I'll maybe try to argue why it's plausible. If I time average this guy, which means getting rid of this time variation in the kinetic energy, if I time average this guy, the exact result of this integral is essentially expressed here. So this is an exact constraint for a convecting system. It involves the viscous dissipation, which is defined here. It's essentially the, the work or the dissipation of energy by the viscous effects in fluids. So that's this guy right here. And then this guy is essentially the buoyancy flux. So in, in a convecting system, what have you got? You've got buoyancy that's doing the work, that's deforming the fluid. That's this guy right here. And essentially what's resisting that is the viscous dissipation in terms of energy. And so that's exactly what we've got here. We've got viscous dissipation. And here we've essentially got the buoyancy flux, or the motion of hot material through a gravity field. And all that I've done is basically recognize the fact that I can take a buoyancy flux and convert it to a heat flux, which is really what the Nusselt number is, and then just add a bunch of other parameters to just get the dimensions right. Question in the back. So normally speaking, when you do the energy equation, uh, if you do the energy equation properly, then usually the kinetic energy appears in the definition of things. But almost in all cases, the amount of energy that the macroscopic motions entail are usually relatively small compared to all the other things, like the heat and the gravitational energy. And so as a normal course of matter, we tend to sort of take the macroscopic part away and treat it separately. You don't have to, right? But it's, it's more often the case that those contributions are relatively small. Michael? First, is your volume here similar to the volume you talked about? OK, so it, this particular volume is the whole fluid. And it, you wouldn't get this result if you didn't do the whole fluid. So this is the whole guy from top to bottom, including boundary conditions. Yeah, that's a good point. It's absolutely not a volume moving with the fluid. This is the whole guy. It turns out, though, when you do the integral over the whole volume, this piece vanishes. The pressure piece vanishes, and all you get is basically the contribution of these two guys, the viscous term, the buoyancy term. Here's the buoyancy term. Here's the viscous term. And now I've just simply re-expressed it in terms of things that we actually care about, things like Nusselt number, for example, and stuff. Okay. Um, so let me just demonstrate this by reproducing the results for the mantle convection problem. Yes? Um, well, I mean, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, essentially this term here, right, is essential. And so, I, so the density I've divided out. What's that? Yeah, yeah, sure, that's right. I wouldn't call it gravitational energy, but it's certainly, it's like gravitational energy. Um, the thing is here, look at this term right here, right? That term is the integral, the, the integral of the partial of V squared with respect to T, 1 half dV, right? That's that first term. I, I, would, I would call that a kinetic change in kinetic energy. In mantle convection problem, you're absolutely right. Maybe this is a good point. In the mantle convection problem, where accelerations are really small, we toss these guys away so they never enter, right? And we just simply have a balance between buoyancy and uh, viscous effects. But I'm saying even for a fluid where inertia is very important, if I do the time average, then none of these inertial terms contribute and I still get something that looks a lot like the mantle convection problem. But I'm going to show you in just a sec that I can use the same result to do a magma ocean and get estimates for velocities and heat transports in that particular case. Does that make sense? Yeah, question at the back. Yeah, right here. Yeah, so this, you can imagine, maybe you can imagine that how this term, when it gets multiplied by V and then integrated over the volume, might become something that looks like that. Okay, so finally, if you take a into the temperature, the thermal energy. Yes. So it kind of couples with thermal So you could put it in, that's right. You have to be very careful. I think <laughs> about every 10 or 15 years, someone will take a Boussinesq calculation and dump the mechanical energy into it and say, I've discovered a new effect that people have ignored. Um, you're absolutely right that if I did a completely compressible problem and I, did, uh, and I had viscous dissipation, that I want to account for that viscous dissipation in my calculation, in my energy equation. 
absolutely true. But it turns out in, in, the, in a problem, how can we put this? If I were to reformulate this in terms of entropy, which I quite agree with Dave's point of view, entropy is a good way to think about this. If I formulated temperature in terms of entropy, then there's going to be another term in that will, will involve the advection of entropy through my temperature field. And it turns out that you can show that that advection of entropy through the uh, temperature field or through the background entropy gradient is going to exactly cancel that viscous dissipation. And so the point is to be, so the easiest way to sort of for me to explain this is if you do Boussinesq, do not add the viscous term to the energy equation because you'll be double counting. And so I, we could certainly sit down and I could show you why this is so. But, but you're right, but there's this caveat because there's these extra pieces in the term in the compressible case that more or less completely cancel that term. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the kinetic energy of the system being constant with time? Well, I'm just time averaging. So I'm saying just tell me what the time average is. And I'm saying the time average. So this describes the time average state. And in the time average state, yeah, the kinetic energy is not changing. Over long times, I guess. Whatever is required, yeah. Several overturn times or whatever is required. Exploring compositionally heterogeneous systems. Right. You might have to be careful, but I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, there's clearly a, there's clearly an issue of time scales, right? So I've got kind of a time scale for the dynamics, then I've got a time scale for the evolution, and it is possible that if the evolutionary time scales and the dynamic time scales are close, maybe it's a little bit difficult to separate those. That's true. In the back of the ocean, the overturn time is it's short. pretty short. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're gonna. I don't know whether I'll give you numbers. I'm not sure where I'll give you numbers, but I'll show you what the expressions for the velocities in the magma ocean actually are, and they're, they're, they're pretty big. Actually, I think Dave actually showed them, right? It was, you had meters to tens of meters per second, right? Yeah, okay. All right, so let's just apply this just as an example. Okay, so here's my dissipation term, right? Here's my gradient in velocities multiplied by viscosities. Here's the fluid motions that I'm kind of imagining for the mantle convection problem, okay? I've got large overturning velocities. If I think about what the gradients in the velocity is, it's of order V divided by the length scale, roughly the length scale of the layer. That's sort of what that looks like to me. And so I could approximate this viscous dissipation just by saying, well, it's some typical value of V divided by the length scale. I square it, multiply the viscosity. It'll give me a reasonable estimate for this guy, okay? And then I just simply take this, substitute it into my time averaged equations, turn the crank, and out comes uh, the uh, velocity of the fluid that's required to be compatible with the conservation of energy equation, okay, the kinetic energy equation. And if I use my boundary layer theory to sort of estimate what my Nusselt number is, uh, I stick it in, I get a number, which is again the velocities, Rayleigh number to the two-thirds. So I essentially reproduce that result that I showed you before. This is probably a little bit more rigorous, maybe a little bit more easy to justify, as long as your estimates of this dissipation are well approximated by this, this should be a good result. And again, I don't really care about the details. And this is, for me at least, the really great power of energy arguments is you don't care about the details as long as you get the energy right. Uh, the details don't matter. Okay, so let's turn now to the, the turbulent uh, convection case. And this is a lot more complicated, you can imagine. But the idea here is that the convection in the fluid is very turbulent. You have these large eddies, sort of large energy-carrying energy eddies, which are unstable, and they break down, and they go to smaller eddies, and then smaller eddies. And Rich sort of very famous quote where he said, you know, large eddies beget small eddies beget small, smaller eddies, and so on, on to viscosity. And so the idea, and sort of the basic idea behind the sort of Kolmogorov scheme, is that you have some energy in your large eddies, and that on a time scale which was comparable to the overturn time, a significant fraction of that energy is then being transferred to the next scale down. And then that happens again and cascades all the way down to the small scales. And so if that picture is, is correct and appropriate for the magma ocean case, then you'd expect the transfer of energy toward the dissipation would depend on the kinetic energy that's in those larger scales. And that, a significant fraction of that is being transferred on the overturn time and the overturn time is just simply L divided by V. So if I put that in for my time, my dissipation should be V cubed by L. Stick it into my time average equation, I've got an estimate for my velocities that come out that would be appropriate for magma ocean. 
And so essentially what I've got here is a Rayleigh number. If I knew what the heat flux was, for example, um, then I could make an estimate of what the velocity is. And this is essentially where those numbers that, that Dave was showing the other day, this is where they come from, this expression, basically. Okay. So maybe to just to wrap this up or just to sort of conclude this discussion, we need maybe to sort of think a little bit about what the Nusselt number actually is. And we can, again, this is slight digression, so if you want to tune out for a sec, it will be perfectly okay. Here's the temperature equation. There's the material derivative of temperature, those two pieces, right? There's the diffusion term. No heat production in this particular problem. And I'm going to just define a thermal power. Think of it like the equivalent of the kinetic energy, but just for temperature. Or think about it as the temperature variance, perhaps, or something like that, right? So I multiply this by T. I integrate it over the volume. Uh, and again, it may be shown, and I'm happy to show you guys if you want to see it, that I can represent the time average of this equation in this form. So this is now the thermal dissipation in some sense, right? the thermal conduction. And then these are all the things that we might be interested in, like the Nusselt number, for example. And so the idea here, and again, this is the underlying assumption of the mixing length model, is that the temperature anomalies, where the conduction actually takes place, is at the end of this inertial cascade. So we've got temperature anomalies, big temperature anomalies in the fluid. They're sort of being cascaded down to smaller scales where they eventually diffuse away. And all that diffusion is happening at the very small scales. But if all of those temperature anomalies are being cascaded with the fluid, then we can estimate what the dissipation is. And it's taking place entirely through the volume of the fluid. Okay? I substitute this guy into this, rearrange, and I basically get the Nusselt number, which has a slightly different dependence on Rayleigh number. It also depends on this ratio of, of diffusivities. So it's, it's a little bit different than the boundary layer model. And it turns out that in order for this model to be right, it has to be that the turbulent convection in the interior actually significantly disrupts the thermal boundary layer. And if that's true, this would be a reasonable estimate um, for the heat flux in a convecting magma ocean. Maybe this is an aside, but the expression in the blue box, of course, doesn't agree with observation. Whose observations, though? Whose observations? Well, I can pick any example, but how about Nemo line and co-op is the nature of that? It was really never the temperature of the six, not yeah. the temperature of the 25. Right. The temperature of the 19. And that was definitely turbulent. Right, right. So is, it, is there something fundamentally wrong with this argument? I, I, I think... I think there is something potentially wrong with this argument. And, and that is that, and, and this is, I guess, the point why viscosity actually really makes a huge difference. So if the viscosity is 0.01 or 0, .0, if it's comparable to water, for example, versus being several orders of magnitude higher, it makes a huge difference. Because if the viscosity of the fluid, let's say so the Prandtl number is a little bit big. So in other words, the viscosity of the fluid is a little bit bigger than the thermal diffusion of the fluid. This is large Prandtl number. If this number gets too big, the assumption that the convection disrupts the boundary layer is probably not true. And so you would really only expect this expression to be true in the limit of a viscosity which is probably smaller, maybe even much smaller than your vis viscosity. Or viscosity much, let me try to say this one more time. Your viscosity has to be much bigger than your thermal diffusivity. And if that's not true, then I think you're probably back really to a boundary layer model. Nusselt number, Rayleigh number to the one third. But you could, even if you, if you did that, um, we're getting a little off topic, but you, you could still, in this expression here, assume a Rayleigh number to the, the one third dependence, and you would get a velocity that depends on Rayleigh number to the four ninths, which is probably a little bit closer to those experimental results. OK, so maybe not a useful digression. But I just wanted to show you vaguely where uh, some of those numbers for the uh, mag motion stuff could, you, how you could derive them, one way you could derive them. Okay. Sure. Right. So this is really just thinking about constant temperatures, right? So, so you know, so so my answer to that would be probably to say something like, well, for some instant of time, this is the evolution versus dynamics timescales again, right? If for some period of time you can assume constant temperatures, for which the dynamics develops, then you don't really care about the evolution. Right? And then you have this new evolutionary state, and the convection adapts to that. So the issue is if the convection adapts relatively quickly to the changing environment, I think the separation of time scales allows it to do that. No? OK, so maybe we'll move on to sort of the last phase. When should I finish up, um, 
discussions. I'm going to finish up in probably about five minutes then, I think. So I'll leave lots of time for questions or an early lunch, maybe. OK. So one of the reasons why we care about this, one of the reasons why we would care about sort of getting Nusselt number relationships, being able to sort of estimate how the Rayleigh number would influence the heat flow, is that we would really like to be able to do extrapolations back in time. We would like to be able to characterize, if, if this is the Earth today and the temperature was, let's say, 100 degrees hotter, how much more vigorous or less vigorous would the convection actually be? And so these scaling relations are essentially a way of going about the question of constructing thermal histories. And so Jeroen was actually talking about this in his research seminar on Tuesday. And I'm going to actually pick up a couple of those points that illustrates the ways in which the convection in the Earth is probably a little bit different than some of these simple models that I've described. Okay, So he showed you the sort of conservation of energy equation for this fluid as a whole. The, there's some mass. There's maybe some average specific heat. This is gradually changing in response to uh, volumetric heat production inside the interior of the mantle. And it can also change because of the convective heat flux that you're taking out the top. So this big Q is just simply the little Q that we've been talking about, this convective heat flux, just multiplied by the area over which that actually applies. Okay. So the point here is that this is an equation that we can actually solve if we accept the scaling relations. Because we know that the convective heat flux, as a function of time, depends on the Nusselt number. And we know that the Nusselt number depends on the Rayleigh number to the 1 3rd power. And we know that the Rayleigh number is going to change for a couple of reasons. It's going to change because the temperature in the fluid is going to change. And it's also going to change because the viscosity of the fluid is going to be dependent on temperature. And so as the fluid cools, the temperature will change, and therefore the viscosity will change, and therefore the viscosity is going to be a function of time. But this is a fully a well-posed system. You could integrate this system. You know, typical models for the viscosity depend on temperature in this sort of form with some uh, activation energy, which plenty of experiments to sort of characterize this stuff. And so we can do these calculations. And this just shows the consequences uh, in a linear scale, which is not normally how you see this, because the variations are usually so big. But just to illustrate just how large these variations are, if we imagine a potential temperature, which is the temperature, if you brought a piece of material of the mantle up to the surface adiabatically, what would its temperature be? Well, today we think roughly about 1350 or thereabouts. And so it's a useful way to characterize the temperature in the interior of the mantle. <clears throat> OK, so if the temperature goes down, the viscosity goes way up. If the temperature goes uh, up, the viscosity goes way down. You stick this into your uh, Rayleigh number relationship, Nusselt number relationship, and this is what you predict for the heat flow. So again, one here at the current time. And as we go back in time, of course, and we get hotter and hotter, the amount of heat flux that's coming out of the system goes up dramatically. And this was the issue of the so-called thermal catastrophe. When people ran these models, as you go back and it was hotter, the viscosity was lower, the Rayleigh number was higher, the convective heat flux was much faster. So the amount of heat that you're taking out of the system is much greater. And when you reconstruct the temperatures, you sort of go off scale as you go back and predict the temperatures at early time. And so this led to the argument that the high rate uh, um, Uri number, basically, was that there was a lot of uh, radiogenic heat inside the Earth. The idea was that if you increase this term quite a bit relative to the convective heats, then you don't change the temperature so much. And therefore, as you go back in time, you don't experience this big problem with high temperatures at early times. So the solution to the problem was to basically play with the radioactive heat source. So the geochemists would argue today that that's a very unreasonable thing to do. Um, and so there have been a number of efforts to actually try to understand what it is about the system that we've described so far that would fix or correct this apparent problem. It's clearly not, not right. And so our simple scaling models clearly can't be an accurate and, and reliable description of the mantle. And certainly one of the things that makes the mantle really different from the models that we've talked about so far is the fact that the mantle melts at mid-ocean ridges and produces chemical variations. And so this is, again, something that Jerome talked about on Tuesday. This just shows a phase diagram of pressure versus temperature. There's a, there's a melting curve, the solidus here, increasing up to the liquidus temperature over here. And you can imagine that you're on one of these uh, mantle uh, potential temperatures that characterize the temperature of the mantle say at 1380, for example, you rise up adiabatically, you cross the liquidus, the solidus temperature, you begin to uh, uh, melt the material. And as you move up, latent heat sort of deflects your path a little bit. But as you move further and further up toward the surface, you produce more and more melt. And the reason why that's interesting is because the melts that you produce, the salts, uh, 
as well as the things that you leave behind by extracting that melt out, have different densities than the stuff that you started with before you melted it. And both of these components are light. And so inher inherently, the material that you're producing at the top will be buoyant. And so similarly, if you go back in time to a place where it was hotter, okay, you begin to melt sooner. And the amount of melt that you produce by the time you get to the top will be much more. So the volume of, of basalt that you've produced and the volume of material that sort of residue will be actually increased. So you have a much larger mass of buoyant material that you've basically got to push down the subduction zone to make this happen. And so there's been a number of efforts to try to sort of quantify this. These are a couple figures from one of Jerome's recent uh, review paper, just simply showing how the thickness of the basaltic crust increases as we go back to hotter temperatures. The thickness of the residue increases as we go back. Because these things are buoyant, you have to cool that package to some amount before it even becomes neutrally buoyant. Okay, and this just shows how long it would take to basically get to that uh, neutral buoyancy. And an estimate that Norm Sleep has made to try to sort of characterize what the effect of this buoyancy would be. So it rises at first as we go back, and then these buoyancy effects kick in and dominate and affect the, the heat flux. Okay, there's been another model that was proposed by Koronaga uh, that suggests that really it's all about the lithosphere. The fact that when you make the lithosphere, you extract this melt, you probably extract water. Uh, extracting water from the material makes the material uh, tougher, stronger. And as a consequence, when you actually take that lithosphere and try to bend it and stick it into the uh, subduction zone, it's actually a lot harder. And so what he's done is he's sort of gone back essentially to an energy equation style thing, he used a bunch of numerical models to try to estimate what the various contributions of the dissipation term that we talked about a little bit earlier. We've got the term that we talked about, which was just sort of the internal deformation, right? The internal flows. And as the temperature goes up, that viscosity goes down. So this term becomes less important as we go back. And that was what was responsible for this sort of classical or reference case, that you get very large variations in heat flow as you increase the potential temperature. But what he argues is that as the lithosphere, the, the melt region gets thicker, the region which gets dehydrated gets larger, that the effective viscosity of that package becomes stiffer. And so its contribution to the dissipation actually goes up. And so that would actually counteract this effect to some extent. And so he's worked out scaling relations and, and argued that you could represent the Nusselt number by what we've talked about so far with this sort of correction that depends on the difference between the viscosity of the lithosphere and the underlying mantle to the extent that that's a viscosity. And then it also depends to some extent on the thickness. Now, both uh, Jun's uh, results, these sorts of heat flux, and also norms, heat flux, in terms of relatively these low values at uh, higher potential temperatures, have a problem. And that is, as you go back in time, um, the, you have much more radioactive heat production in the mantle. And if at the same time your surface heat flux is decreasing, the amount of cooling in the mantle goes down. And it turns out that for a lot of these models, the amount of cooling that you get in the core goes down. And you actually, it's very, very difficult to power a magnetic field under these cases. And so a lecture, I think, next week at some point, we'll look a little bit at the evolution of the magnetic field and the extent to which the magnetic field tells a lot about which of these models is liable to be correct. Yeah. Yeah. You're not comfortable with the no, I'm I'm happy with that. Sure, why not? Uh, I, I guess I'm all I'm saying is that it's really difficult to appeal to this mechanism, essentially to have the heat flow drop this low um, at this particular time when when you have quite a lot of radioactive heating in the mantle. You just simply won't cool the core enough. So I'm not advocating for one Uri ray really Uri number or another. But what I'm pointing out is that if the surface heat flow is this low at this temperature, in most thermal history models, it will be very hard to drive a dynamo. Uh, that would be, that would be, uh, well, all indications seem that it's getting worse rather than better. But we will absolutely come, ba we will absolutely come back to this. Yeah. Right. For the present day Earth, right. because it really strongly overestimates the the, the, the yeah. No, I, I yeah, I completely agree so, with you. And in rocks, even at this the is last slide. The lithosphere is always 
Right. I agree completely with you. So. <clears throat> no, but it doesn't work. The reality doesn't work today. Before you apply it to the past. Right. So this is actually a good segue, and I feel a little bit less guilty about the, sh the shameless self-promotion here. But actually, this is kind of relevant from the point of view of, of, of CIDR, because actually the work that went into this was actually grew out of the uh, CIDR workshop that we had uh, last year. So Greg Hirth came, gave a superb talk on mantle rheologies. And actually, in addition to sort of presenting the basic ideas and showing some of the experimental results, took his models and made predictions of things that you could test in the field. And the number of times which it was possible to take these laboratory measurements, extrapolate them through the orders of magnitude in strain rates that are required to apply them to the Earth, and have them still be successful was, to me, actually quite remarkable. And so it was a very simple thought, very simple paper, uh, and which is why it didn't take very long to, to write up. But the idea was, let's take the best estimates of the rheological models that have come out of the laboratories and ask the question, what would they do for the dynamics of subduction, for the, the bending dissipations, all those sorts of questions. And so we knew, for, actually for quite a long time, that in the shallow part of the lithosphere, Barley's Law, this Coulomb failure, was a pretty good description. And it worked for a lot of different rocks. It seemed to be pretty reliable. At much higher temperatures, it was pretty clear that the high temperature uh, creeps in olivines that experiments had been being done for, for decades really were pretty, pretty reasonable and pretty good. And technological advances, maybe in the last sort of few years, have made it possible to do deformation experiments in sort of this intermediate region where it's, it, the pressure is too high to have Coulomb failure, but the temperatures are too low to have sort of the classical high temperature diffusion creep. And so there's been a number of experiments that have sort of ex constrained this sort of intermediate intermediate region, and all that we did was to simply take those rheological laws, construct a composite that allowed all of them to operate, but the one that was most effective would obviously be the one that dominates. And you can predict uh, stress states in a bending stresses in a subducted lithosphere as a function of essentially age, which is really the function of the temperature profile through the slab. That's what we're looking at. And so it looks a lot like these strength profiles, but I guess I would stress the fact that really this is a, a calculation where the strain rate is increasing linearly as we move off the midpoint, midplane of the slab, which are these sort of peak points. So one of the things that came out of this is you can calculate all sorts of things. You can calculate things like the bending moments. And this is actually related to the resistance that bending exerts on the lithospheric plates. And you can take these number and ask the question, is it big or is it small? And it turns out it's actually not very big. Question. Yeah, I think it might be even smaller because we're getting um, salt and we're getting hydrated. So yeah, this came up, this came, question came up y yesterday. And I guess, you know, I, right. So the argument was that you get faults, water gets down there, and that weakens the plate. But here's an alternative point of view you had to crack the lithosphere before you got the water down there. So I would make the claim that unless the water is somehow making it easier to fracture the plates, the water is kind of like an afterthought. It's not really changing. Maybe then subsequently unbending the plate once the water is there may be a role. But if you're initially got to crack a dry plate to get the water in, then the relevant rheology that describes that deformation process is the dry one. Right? And, so, and it would only be if you could get water to the crack tip and actually somehow have that water influence the propagation of that crack, would I say water would actually alter these results. So we, we can talk about that. But that's, that, would be my, that would be my bias. So maybe last point, and we'll just simply wind up. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this is that when you change the plate velocities, going here from one millimeter per year all the way up to 100 millimeter per year, you hardly change the stress at all. So in other words, the resistance to bending, the sort of bending force on the plate, hardly changes at all. So it's a situation where essentially it's, it's hard to get it started, right? There's a big cost or, or, or resistive force to get it started. But as you increase the velocity, there's almost no additional resistance that's imposed. And so it's, it's behaving almost like a perfectly plastic plate. And there's actually lots of interesting um, uh, consequences of this, the sort of power law rheology, if you wanted to sort of describe this composite rheology with a very simple power law rheology, that power law rheology would have an exponent of about 13 or 14. So it's almost like a perfectly plastic material. Okay, well, let me just sum up. 
So I would say that we can really make sense of mantle convection, even with very simple systems, understand kind of how they work using this simple boundary layer theory. You know, when we applied it to the context of the Earth, it gave sort of roughly the right um, lithospheric thicknesses. It gave reasonable estimates for the fluid velocities. And yet, when we try to extrapolate it back in time, both of those results that I've showed previously, both Norm Sleeps and John Cornaga's, suggest that we're not even really sure about the sign of, of how things change as we go back. So perhaps we're just fortuitous, but more likely the problem is a lot more complicated than what I've described. Uh, the, the issue of heat flow, I think the magnetic field actually tells us quite a lot of what the heat flow has to be, provided our current understanding of the magnetic field is correct. But we, for example, don't know how to predict, say, the number or the sizes of plates. We don't understand how the configuration of plates might actually play a role. And there's also sort of these sort of wild cards that may involve surface and uh, climate issues. And I just wanted to just convey one sort of maybe crazy story. It's an idea that uh, Jim Casting has proposed. And he points out that the mid-ocean ridges are nominally two and a half or so kilometers uh, below the seafloor. And that if you ask the question, where does all the hydrothermal circulation take place at a mid-ocean ridge that sort of brings heat out of the interior and also hydrates the crust, he points out that the current configuration of water depth and the height of the ridge is just about right so that the water, as it's moving through parts of the oceanic crust, uh, is critical at its critical point. And so it lowers the viscosity, it changes a lot of the thermal properties, and it really potentially affects the way in which the hydrothermal circulation flows through a mid-ocean ridge system. So as we go back in time and you imagine that you're melting a thicker uh, crust, thicker um, residue, that material is going to be more buoyant. Potentially it floats a little bit higher. And so this could potentially actually change the way in which water interacts with the ridge, which changes the amount of water that's being delivered to the interior. You know, whether this is right or not right, it's just one of those very interesting examples of how the interactions of the climate, syst or the climate system with the interior can actually potentially play a huge role in the way the mantle evolves. And so I think even though <clears throat> this model provides a good intuitive picture for what's actually going on, there's clearly an awful lot of complexity that still we need to shine some light on. Thanks very much. So there are, so the question is, are the influences of latent heat and related associated with phase transitions taken into these, uh, count these calculations? And the answer is yes. Turns out that the latent heat is probably not the bigger of the, of the several effects that arise in phase transitions. Two things happen, right? When you move material across a phase boundary, you have latent heat released or absorbed, but you also deflect the phase boundary by virtue of the temperature changing where the uh, intersection of the phase curve actually occurs. And as you go to higher and higher Rayleigh numbers, it turns out that that phase boundary deflection is probably a bigger effect in the dynamics. So partial melting, generally speaking, is not taken into account in very many of these calculations. And really, the only calculation that I've seen so far that's done this is a very recent one that was published by um, um, Nakagawa and Tackley just a couple of months ago. I think from my point of view, the interesting thing is really it's the buoyancy that gets left behind by that partial melting may in fact be the more interesting and maybe more important effect. But, but I think that's what we want to do, though. I would, I would claim, I agree with you completely that it's complicated, but I think that's exactly what we want to do, though. It's, it's 
Well, 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 Mm-hmm. Uh, there can be other complications. Sure, of course. Um, uh, so before we actually kind of will take the trust of this parameter rather than convection model, we have to understand the detail of dynamics. Oh yeah, I guess uh, that's that right. Be, you know, that step cannot be skipped. Rather, rather, otherwise, we will kind of make a form of stuff. Yep, no, that's right. But I would still make the argument that ultimately where we want to go is some sort of parameterized description. I mean, parameterized description sort of has um, a bad connotation for some reason in geophysics. But in many fields, scaling relations are actually really quite important because they reflect the fact that you understand the system. And so to the extent that you can construct scaling relations means that you begin to understand the system. And so to me, that's actually a desirable place to go. The, 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 the counterpoint is that you, you can then perhaps reliably start to construct thermal histories from these. But I agree, they're not going to be simple. But I would also think that you probably don't care about the details of individual subducted slabs breaking off. What you want in the same way that you averaged to do the boundary layer model, what you want is some sort of time averaged behavior, if you want almost a statistical description that sort of characterizes the evolution of the system over time. And I would say that would be a very desirable goal. And there's a lot of people that are involved in trying to do this. And it's going to require numerical models, and it's going to require then interpreting what the numerical models are. But if you could take a numerical model, extract the insights, and write it down in terms of the scaling relations, then I think it reflects the fact that you actually understand the system that you're dealing with to some extent. You know, the answer is it certainly doesn't look like it, does it? It doesn't look like it. And would a Jew that analysis, you know, with a blindfold test, would say, yes, we should have. No, I would say it's amazing. To me, I guess when we understand how plate tectonics works, then maybe it will be surprising. To me, if you run a calculation without doing anything fancy, you'll get stagnant lead. So the surprise is that you get plate tectonics, not that you get. So Mars, Venus, presumably uh, Mercury, sort of all stagnant one plate lids on the top, that's your expectation. And any deviation from that is the anomaly. Which goes back to the standard argument that we had it because we had water. Well, I mean, that's a popular idea, right? But I, I guess ultimately the understanding will come from is figuring out how that actually works in detail. Oh, one last question. <laughs> Um, that's a matter of some debate. Um, you know, it was funny. <laughs> when I was a postdoc, we tried to publish a paper where we used the heat flux of six terawatts uh, to drive a thermal evolution model in the core. And the editor wrote back and says, that's an absurdly high value. You can't publish that result. So we had to do something lower. I would say uh, the six terawatts now is sort of increasingly on the low end of estimates. But I think the, the, the still, even though the heat flows are getting larger from the bottom, I think mostly it's still a top-down driven system. That's my guess. Who knows? But in many of these thermal evolution models, the core is not explicitly considered. But if you do coupled models where you have both the core and the mantle, what you discover with these very low heat flows at early times in Earth's history is you just can't take enough heat out of the core. If the core doesn't cool, you don't get a dynamo basically. And so you have to cool it, not only have to cool it, but you have to cool it fast enough to reach some criterion. And that criterion actually is increasingly high as time seems to go on. How far back do you want to make that field? So we have observations going back three and a half billion years. So they're not detailed observations, but we know that there is a field on the planet at three and a half billion years. And there's no evidence that we ever lost that field. Um, of course, there's probably places where you could probably do it, but that's special pleading. There's no argument that there has to be a field at very, very early times. Um, parsimony suggests that that's true, but I'll actually show you next week that it's quite plausible from thermal evolution models to have a period where you have a field, early days, the field goes away for a little bit, and then it comes back again. Mm. How about saving 
Right. Make sure we sit at the same table. Okay. Thanks. So let's bring forward.